you know, we're all in, in process, all of us. I just don't process on the wrong side of the cross. If I process on the before it's finished, I'm in trouble. But if I process the from it's finished, then God can work with that. Because you have to get over what he already got over so that you can step into who he's called you to be. Amen? And that only comes from righteousness. And that's super, super powerful. Waking up free, going to bed free, that's powerful. Waking up in the middle of the night and not thinking about trouble from the day, that's powerful. Because if you think about trouble from the day today, then you're gonna be thinking about what about tomorrow? And then we're caught up in that whole thing that we're not supposed to be. And then your lamp gets dim, your eye, and you start to not see single vision because the eye is the lamp of the body and if your whole, if your body's full of light, then that's the most amazing place to be. But it's full of darkness. It says how great is that darkness. Your perspective is everything. So we need to see. You know when it says, when we're, when we're talking about just one look with just one look with just one look, there's a reason why it's so powerful. And it's not just because Maverick City did it. It's because that fixes everything. John the Baptist said, behold the lamb. Behold, look at the lamb. The Bible says in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Like looking unto him. Looking and seeing the reality of what he did for us. That is where everything changes. Where you become captivated, where your gaze hooks into his and you can never look away. And that's where we are. That's where no backsliding happens. Oh my. Backsliding is unnecessary. Burnout is unnecessary. It's unnecessary. The only reason you backslide is because you haven't ever slid home. All right. The only reason that someone would backslide is because they've never slid home. Home is knowing who you're created to be, who he's created you to be, but knowing your creator. Knowing God, it's all about the Father. They wanted to kill Jesus because he said about the Father. He was good until he said, the Father and I are one. Then it was game on. They're like, we're gonna kill you because you, you claim to be you know, like God. And that's a pretty crazy place to be. But when you see what righteousness is and you've been reconciled, just like Jason said, the ministry of reconciliation, you become an ambassador of reconciling people back to the Father. And that's where persecution is. I'm serious, man. And it all flows from the place of being right with God. Because when you see that, all hell breaks loose. The enemy isn't really concerned about you saying you're a Christian. He is not totally consumed with people having churches. He is very, very concerned about you knowing that you're the temple. If he can remove, if he can remove Jesus from here in you being your Lord, He's already started to win. Jesus being our savior is amazing. Jesus being our Lord is where we step into after we know he's our savior. I went home today after service and <clears throat> played with my kids a little bit I did a couple of things and then I went right back to the, to the room. I, I put Asher to bed to take a nap. And I went over and I just laid in the bed and I just said, Jesus, I worship you. And just loved on him. And about 30 minutes I, I was there. And then I went back in my closet. 
and his smile met me there. Wow, I guess I'll have to talk about vulnerability again. <laughs> Do you remember in July, who was here in July, when I preached to only three of you? So in July, <laughs> I'm just kidding. In July, I preached a message about I repent for not preaching the full gospel. And like, it was amazing, like all kinds of different camps that I'm just gonna be careful in choosing my words. All kinds of different folks out there, Christians, thought I said, I repent for preaching a false gospel. It was crazy. I didn't say that, I said the full, which meaning, which meant there's so much more to this gospel that I haven't even seen yet. But we should all be pretty aware that there's a lot more than we think we know. Unless, of course, you think you know it all. And that's not gonna fly, right? And so, I heard Bill Johnson say this once. He said, um, always remain a novice. Never think that you've arrived. I'm good with that. What we can't afford to do, what we can't afford to do is live as an infant without nourishment. Yes, it's true that I'm captivated with just one look. But if I don't find out what this book says about me, then I can look at him all day long, but he really, really, really wants me to know this. You know what, Jason was talking about his face, and, which is so true, like God revealing himself. All through scripture, it talks about Jesus revealing the face of God. The face of God was revealed when Jesus got baptized in the River Jordan and came up out of there, the heavens were opened and boom. Jesus was the visible image of the invisible God and when you see Jesus, you see the Father, right? Like it's all through scripture. It says in the beginning, in the book of John, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. That means this that when I open this book, or your iPad, wherever the Bible's on, when I open it and I look into it, I'm looking at, into God's face. <clears throat> what's happening and what's happened is so many times we've tried to open it and not understood it, understand it, so we need someone else to help us understand it, which is okay, but if we see where scripture comes from and the truth of it, Everything shifts and everything changes. You are meant to be filled with the wisdom of God. You are meant to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. You are required by scripture, by God, to know the will of the Lord. Not just in some situations, in every situation that you face. How could he ask me to everything that I do and everything that I say, do it, say it, as unto the Lord, if he didn't require me first to know his will. Are you with me? The will of God is revealed in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus never did anything apart from God's will, never said anything apart from God's will. If you wanna know the perfect picture of what God's will was, then you have to look at Jesus. Because Jesus was the visible image of the invisible God, the express image of the Father. So when you see Jesus, you see the Father. A lot of times we have trouble with the whole word father because of how we grew up and how we were raised and my father wasn't there for me or my dad abandoned me and man, I'm just, I'm okay with God being God, but I'm not okay with him being father. That's not gospel. Jesus said, if you don't believe me, even though he was speaking what God was saying, if you don't believe me through the things that I say, at least believe me through the works that I do, because the Father that dwelleth in me does the works. So he was saying, the works that I do reveal the Father. God is requiring us to do the same works that Jesus did. 
But let's never forget that Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. So yes, healing is part of the will of God because Jesus did it. I always tell people, if, like as I talk to people everywhere I go about healing and about miracles because that's where people's questions are. They're like, well, I mean, because there's so much controversy just in the church alone. Just so much controversy about whether God heals, whether he wants to, whether it's his will to, and how can you say that it's always God's will to heal? You pray for people and they don't get healed. I guess it wasn't God's will. That's not what scripture says. Are you with me? Like if I see it in Jesus' life, I have, to re- I have a reason to go after it. If I see Jesus healing the sick, people are like, well, you know, sometimes people bring that stuff on themselves. I get it, but once Jesus comes in, you no longer reap what you sow, you reap what he's sown. It's different. But if you don't get in the truth and find out what the truth says, you'll think that what you feel is God. You'll think that how you feel is God. And, and when someone says something, look, I, I don't care what church they're from, I don't care what stream they're from, you better know what's in this book. You can't afford to be unwise. You need to know God's will. And if you grow up in religion, and religion teaches you that the miracles are not for today because the day that the disciples left the planet, all the miracles stopped. That's just so weird. When I got saved, like, I, I never read that part, and I saw miracles happen, like, in Dan's life, and I was fascinated. I'm like, this is real. Like, this is real. Guy's dying of leukemia. He's on hospice, he gets prayer, he walks out the same way he walked in. And then the medical report two weeks come back, two weeks later comes back, he's completely leukemia free. So in a young believer's mind, my mind, as a young believer, I went, oh my God, I'm praying for everybody. (laughs) What did the disciples say? They said, we cannot help but to speak about the things that we've both seen and heard. Jesus was a complete show and tell the Father. I'm gonna tell you about the Father, I'm gonna represent the Father, I'm gonna demonstrate what the Father looks like. And everywhere he went, healing happened, miracles happened. Everywhere he went, he was supernatural, why? Because Jesus was doing the miracles? Yes, he was, but it was only through agency of God the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus was fully fully abandoned, utterly abandoned to God. And Jesus' link with the Father was Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And now when we get saved as children of God, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes here. Why? Because he wants to make you like Jesus. Jesus never took glory unto himself. He didn't. He gave glory unto the Father. Oh, that's awesome. We're never supposed to do things to receive glory for ourselves. We're supposed to do things to glorify the Father. Let them see your good works so that they will glorify your Father. That's awesome. All this is scripture, but so many times we read books about the Bible because we wanna know, because we, like with me, when I got saved, I was like, I couldn't read, and then all of a sudden, the Bible became the first book that read me. That book reads you. Like when you get in it, that's why people don't like reading certain things, because they know there are things in their life that need to change, but the very things they don't wanna read is the very things you need to eat. Because when you eat it, it will come in and completely change your internal system and your complete mindset of your way of thinking to make you actually conform to his image instead of being conformed to the world's image. He will transform you from the inside out. There is no way for you, there's no way for this to happen any other way. You come to church all your life and still be just as far along as you were the day you got saved. You can go to a building all your life. You have to do some work. People are like, no, it's not works, it's grace. No, yes, it's by grace you got saved. But when you stand before him, you're gonna be judged for your works. People are like, I don't don't believe it. That's because you didn't read the Bible. (laughs) 
Are you guys with me? This is fascinating to me. I'm like, I'm so filled with joy. Yeah, you're gonna have to listen to today's message because I can't do it. I just, I talked about how I tried to fix everything. Like, you know this building is pretty big? You know that we came here and didn't have anything and then we moved into this building and it was amazing and Tom did a wonderful job at like holding things together and then Tom went his way and then we stayed here and I was like, okay, I can do this. Oh my God, I couldn't do this. I proved that for 17 months. Ask my staff. It's not like, it's not like everything's in confusion, but the problem is, is that when I think that I can fix stuff that grace isn't on my life to fix, it doesn't get fixed, it gets confusing. And so what I did was I caused confusion in a bunch of areas. It wasn't, there wasn't any blatant sin, weird stuff. It was just, I would go, hey, how does this work to people that had it working? And they were like, why is he asking me? Thinking like I'm trying to investigate whether they're doing their job. But I was just curious and I wanted to know everything was working well. So see, the best place for me to be was outside and not say, how's this going? The best place for me to be was pray, seek the Lord, give myself to the preaching of the word and go after this thing with everything in me and let them do their job where grace is on their life. And so if I try to put that grace on my life, it does not work. I proved it. <laughs> I'm serious. And so this last week has been the most painful week of my whole entire life, even before Christ. I know, crazy. To where the reality of me needing help hit me. Not that I didn't know I needed help, but like, I'm like gonna do coaching and all kinds of different stuff to like make sure that I can be the proper leader that you guys deserve. So I'm going through it and it's amazing and I'm gonna like, I'm going after it with all my heart. People are like, oh man, I don't know dude, that's weird. Now I'm like wondering if you really are, no I am who I say I am. I love Jesus with all my heart, I do. I just believe that my staff deserve better and why would I think that I could lead, <clears throat> wow, okay. There are grace, there's grace on people's lives. And when you get around, like Bill Johnson said, if you, want to kill, if you want to kill giants, hang around a giant killer. Here's why. Because like David killed Goliath, was a giant killer, and raised up mighty men. Mighty men, some of the greatest warriors that this world has ever seen, why? They were all disgruntled, they were all broken, they were all of contrite heart. These men were disgraced to society, and David's like, come with me. Took them into a cave, and they came out some of the greatest champions that this world has ever seen. Why? Because the grace that was on David's life. What was on David's life? A love for a father. He was a man that was after God's heart. And so what happens is you got all kinds of people around you. Um, I, I spoke this this morning just on the reality of being vulnerable, admitting that you can't do everything. And I was well aware of that. But the fact is, is that when I, like I have no idea about like technology. I don't wanna know about technology. <laughs> but if I spent time with somebody that knows about technology, I would know way more than me just not wanting to know about it because I would be with them and the grace that's on their life would hit mine. There's just certain graces that I don't want. But there's grace on people's life. If I hang out with a worship leader, like, like Rachel's amazing and, and, and she's just leading so well. If I hung out with her in the place of worship, that thing would get on my life, why? Because the grace that's on someone else's life will get on yours if you give yourself to that. Are you with me? If you're on a highway and you drive by a big truck, do you ever feel it suck you over? Like, whoa, what was that? Like you're driving, like I drove like a Jeep for a while. You have a Jeep with a soft top on, everything moves your vehicle when you're cruising. But a big truck, whoa, that's crazy. You know if you tuck behind that truck, there's, there's, 
there's a draft on that truck that keeps you right behind it. You know, on a racetrack with NASCAR and all that, when those cars are going around, if you notice, when another car comes right up on it, they stay in each other's draft. And so we need to learn as a body. I want to, as the church, to be able to glean from and to get grace that's on other people's lives. That's how the body functions beautifully. That's why it says, don't say to the hand, I don't need you. Don't say, no, no, no. We need each other. I mean, we need Jesus first and foremost. And we have to live from the place of the it is finished. We can't live on the other side of the cross to where we don't know that it's finished. We have to live because the it is finished produces the righteousness of God. And you start to see that you're right with the Father. That makes your perspective teachable. If we don't hit the reality of being sons, then we're orphans and we remain jealous of other people. We remain jealous, we remain full of envy, we remain full of self-seeking, but that self-seeking isn't gospel self-seeking, that's selfishly seeking. And that selfishness is the opposite of righteousness. Because when I see that I've been given all things according to life and godliness, and I have all things in Christ, that when I see that I'm actually a joint heir in Jesus Christ, I don't have to compete anymore. I can actually celebrate you You can celebrate other people for the person that God created them to be. Look, John, the, John, you got the disciple John, and you're looking through the Gospel of John, you read through. Peter really jacked stuff up. But John was the disciple that knew he was the one that Jesus loved. And when you look at the end of John, John celebrated Peter. Why? Because Peter wasn't a threat to John. Sonship helps you celebrate other people. And you can see the grace on their life and celebrate what's on their life and not be afraid to celebrate it. Oh, man. Does that make sense? So I'm stepping into this season, like we're growing, like, like the whole, the school's empty. You know, it's gonna be empty in, in May. That means that that school's available. Do you understand how big of a project that is? So I'm sitting back thinking about this and I'm like, wow, that's huge. It'd probably be good for me to not just do it without the proper planning. But, but the kid in me wants to say, I'm not kidding, I promise. Ask my wife. <laughs> Look, Angie just tapped her on the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So here's the deal with me. I, I shared this this morning. Reinhardt, Reinhardt marked my life. One of the things he marked my life, Reinhardt Bunky, for those of you that don't know, amazing. Think Mufasa from Lion King. Just, I say that because the hyenas were like, Mufasa, woo, say it again. Like, what a man of God, what a father. Like I'm talking 80 million people have come to Christ through that ministry that Daniel Kalenda is heading and, and running crazy and it's just gonna be amazing. About, I think it was, I'm not positive, it was probably eight years ago, Daniel Kalenda, and Reinhardt shared this at the first school of evangelism that I went to be uh, uh, just a student at, but he shared this, he said that Reinhardt called me on a Sunday morning he said, I just wanna tell you what kind of person Reinhardt is. And he goes, Reinhardt called me Sunday morning. He lives in West Palm Beach. I'm in Orlando at the CFAN place, at the CFAN's, um, the offices. He said, he called me Sunday morning and he goes, he goes, Daniel, I'm on my way to visit you right now. And he, he, Daniel said, Reinhardt, it's Sunday. He goes, I need you to listen. God has spoken. And I'm like, what did he say? You know, it's just a Reinhardt preach the ABCs, the gospel, and you literally want to get saved every time. I'm not kidding. Like he will share, and you're just like, oh my God. Oh, altar call. I'm in. Like, I don't care how long you've been saved. I I'm so serious. The, the love of God that that man carried 
and the gospel that he preached. But Reinhardt said this. He said, he said, God has spoken. I want you to meet me. So Daniel met him at a restaurant. And Reinhardt's sitting at the table with his hands on the table. And he goes, the Lord said, we are to buy an office in Orlando. No, wait. This is before they had the office. I'm sorry. In Orlando. Sorry. I'm backtracking. They were just working. They were working out of different places. But it was all about Africa. Reinhardt said, we need to do this. And Daniel said, Reinhardt, you said we're not supposed to invest in brick and mortar. And Reinhardt said, the Lord has spoken. He said, well, Reinhardt, we can't call any realtors because it's Sunday. Reinhardt goes, he has spoken. And Daniel's like, okay, well, what shall we do? He goes, nothing. Here's what he said. When the Lord speaks, I want him to see me jump. And that hit me. There was nothing they could do on a Sunday morning. But Reinhardt heard the Lord, got in his car and drove just to tell somebody, this is what God has said. And I want him to see when he speaks, I jump. And that hit me, it marked me, man. And it made me even more zealous. I came back from that school of evangelism. I couldn't even talk for two weeks. Like I couldn't even, the church was like, what happened? And I'm like, Whoa, just a mess. Couldn't even function. It, something hit me, but that piece right there hit me so hard. So I wanna be obedient. So when God speaks to me, I wanna jump. I wanna, I wanna lunge. I wanna jump. I need him to see that I am, I'm, I'm in it. That's how I live my life. Unfortunately, that when it comes to things like this, it's probably good to run that by other people. Meaning, there's a school over there. I wanna fill it right now, right now. But there are systems, there are strategies, there is staffing, there is planning, and all that stuff needs to take place because you don't wanna start something and not count the cost. You wanna make sure that you do it with wisdom. Yes, it's faith. Faith says we're gonna do it, and we're gonna do it. How? I don't know. When? I don't know. But I wanna do it now. I do, he knows that. But I've got other people that are around me to make it happen. Like, I don't know how to like hire a bunch of teachers. Like, what am I gonna ask them? Do you like teaching? Here's my, here's my qualification, pray in tongues. If they can't, I'm sorry. We'd love to have you. Are you open to the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I have to have spirit-filled teachers. I can't not have that. I know things that I need to have, but I, if I just rush into something, I'm gonna mess it up. So I'm learning that I have many people around me to help me make more educated decisions. Here's why. Because I'll get a vision from the Lord and I'll announce it on the stage. And my staff sits over there and goes, Ooh. I remember there was a girl, you, do you guys know Deethra? She was with us for a while. I remember coming off the stage one night, she goes, I quit. She went, it was a common joke. It was a I quit joke, really. I quit, why? Oh my God, you scare me. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm gaining wisdom from a multitude of counselors. Because I need to know that this thing is going to be amazing. I wanna have the school filled, spirit filled teachers. I wanna have the whole school filled with students that are full of the Holy Ghost. I wanna, I wanna go after this thing with everything that I am. But as far as when, I don't know. But yes, we're gonna do it. So what I've done this last week, I realized I've wanted to do a lot of different things, and I'm the visionary. See, here's what I, I can do this. I, I'm the guy that like, here's the goal. God just gave me a vision. Boom, that's where we're going. But what I haven't done is thought out strategically, how are we gonna get there? I don't have to. I have to have other people that can think strategically that are full of God, full of Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, full of grace, that they have that grace on their life to make sure that everything functions with excellence. 
So that's where I'm at. I've just like, this last week was this wake up of my heart realizing that there's a better way of doing things. And it involves every other, every people that can do this and they have the grace on their life. Does that make sense? Okay, and in saying that, as a church, there are people here that have skill sets that you do not have. There are people that are part of the congregation. There are, people, there are members here that, don't, that, that have skill sets that you don't have and you're never gonna know what skill sets they have unless you actually meet them. So what if we could be a church that actually knows different people that are in the church that were actually family? How do we get there? Like, if we're really gonna have a church where community becomes family, then we need to do something. We need to like head towards that. Growth tracks, how many of you have done them? What you think? Pretty good? So what we wanna do is we wanna do growth tracks so we can all be on the same page, right? But I really would like to do, because we wanna do, we wanna do like small groups, I wanna have fellowship outside of here, like coming on a Sunday is awesome, but what if you actually had friends that actually became family to where they fight for you? We need this, man. And I'm like, I really need help in how to establish this. We right now, in, in, in kids, we had 213 kids there this morning in kids' church. There are not enough volunteers to help with all the kids that are coming. And we need people to actually follow through when they say they're gonna be here, to actually be here. Because now we're running into people that have said they would and then they call in and they say, I can't. So let your yes be yes. And let your no be no. Anything else is of the evil one. If it's no, that's fine. But if it's yes, Put your feet there and do it. Are you with me? One for you, Natalie. (laughs) She's doing an amazing job. I need help. I want to raise up champ. I want the kids to be champions, man. I want them to take out the devil. I want them to be a threat to hell, man. I want my school that we're going to form to be a threat to hell that the devil trembles. Because these kids say the name of Jesus and it's not just some Jesus that they don't know. But I want them to be able to hear the Holy Ghost. I want them to be filled with the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that we're filled with. I want them to learn what fellowship looks like before they get into a place where they're not in the kids, in the youth, so now they're a part of a congregation, but they've grown up in fellowship. They've grown up in this place where they prefer one another. They've grown up in a place of, the church is my family. To where they they go to church, but they're a part of a family. They don't just go to a church and see how the worship is and see how things are over here, and then go over here and see how it is over there. Then it's okay over there. And man, I want family. I don't want just people that come to a building on a Sunday. I want family. The enemy is threatened by family. Watch this. The enemy is threatened by family that know their father. When you have a bunch of people that get together that know who their father is and they actually know their identity from the place of sonship, from the place of righteousness, knowing that they're sons and daughters of the one and only true God, knowing that eternal life, Jesus defined eternal life In John 17, three, this is eternal life, that they might know you. So when we begin our journey in Christianity, we don't know God as a father. We we hear our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But it's different when you understand that the father actually dwells in you. See, when I say our father who art in heaven, what happens is I look towards heaven because that's where the father is and not realize that God the Holy Ghost has come to set up camp in me. He's in you, like he's in you. It's real. Okay, let me just share a little. I hope that made sense. (laughs) 
Gosh. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Jason shared that. I want to just show you a scripture in Colossians 1. In verse 19, it says this. He was talking about Jesus for him. I'll just, just go back. Jesus, verse 15, is the image of the invisible God. Man, right before that, it says we have redemption through the forgiveness of our sin. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, wait a second. Adam was the one that was first here. No, this is different. See, when you get born, see, Jesus was the firstborn among God's creation on this earth. Watch this. When you get born again, you become a new creation. Are you with me? Check this out. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Oh my gosh, I love this so much. Oh, no, 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 just keep going. Okay, so, because there's so much in here. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Watch this. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, in Jesus. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through his death in order to present you before him holy and blameless beyond reproach. Do you have to do anything to be holy and blameless and beyond reproach? Why did Jesus hang on the tree? So that you, when you get born again, can be presented to the Father holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This this is such a hard thing, but it really is simple through the lens of righteousness. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so that we might become something Did you earn this or did he pay for this? So how can you, by works, receive something that was given to you by grace? But if you don't see what was given to you by grace, you'll think that you have to earn it by works. And your works have to be the byproduct of what you've received by grace. (laughs) I just wanted to go off. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, I get it. <laughs> this is the key to everything. It is the it is finished. Something so powerful was in the it. I said it a couple weeks ago. I'm telling you, it's profound. It's the last words that he said. Why? On the tree, he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when I see that I've become righteousness, His, not mine, I didn't earn it through works because all of our works are as filthy rags to the Father, but what he did, he did for me to become that. It's called grace, it's called the cross, it's the finished work, it's finished. I can't add to it or I'm cursed. He did it, it was in his plan. He planned that and when you see that God knew your sin, your junk, and all the stuff that you were into when you see that he saw it the whole time. When when you see that, you'll realize how great his love is. Because he should have smote you because the wages of sin is death. But he didn't. He put it all on his son. And Jesus bore in his body on a tree 
my sin. Jesus was bruised for our iniquity. He was crushed for our iniquity. He was striped for our healing. He was pierced for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon his head through that crown. Like he paid it all, why? So that I could have peace. So that I could have rest, so that I could cease from my striving and enter in to his rest. Not my rest, his rest. I could enter in to his Sabbath. Jesus is the Sabbath. Gosh. What if every day was Sabbath to you? And what if every day you could go through your life and not be stressed out about life, but actually be in the place of his grace? And you could see it. Oh gosh, I love this. I'm just say this again. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. How did the Father dwell in Jesus with all his fullness? How? Please don't say you don't know this. It's not a trick question. How did God dwell in Jesus? Okay, easy, easy answer. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus was filled with God's fullness. What is God's fullness? Holy Spirit. Which Holy Spirit dwells in you? A different one or the same? The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Are you with me? This is like not hard, it's gospel. He didn't pay a price to live outside of you the disciples were walking with Jesus and he said, I will not leave you as orphans. The Holy Spirit that is with you will be in you. The Holy Spirit's not just with you, he's in you. That takes orphan out and puts sonship in. The fullness of God. It says that we are the body of Christ, the church. In Ephesians 4, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So what if every Christian was a full house? What if every Christian was full of God? Well, I've got news for you. Every Christian that's born again is. But what you don't know will kill you. <laughs> what you don't know will kill you in the kingdom. In the world, what you don't know won't hurt you. In the kingdom, we perish for lack of knowledge. Oh, gosh. Look, it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Guess what ministry you've been given? Reconciling people back. You got the same ministry that Jesus had, except you don't have to head to the cross, you just have to carry yours. Oh man, okay, I'm so excited. I'll be more excited than all of you, it doesn't matter, because I'm fascinated, I'm just fascinated. I'm fascinated. Like today I went in my prayer room and I'm like, oh my gosh, for real? Ephesians 3, listen to this. Mm. This is the New American Standard. Paul says, and this is the Pauline, one of the Pauline prayers. You got Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, Philippians, Ephesians 3. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. It's all about the Father. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now look, he says in Ephesians 1 that he might grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? In the knowledge of him. So it's all about being filled with his knowledge. It's all about being filled with the knowledge of him. So watch this that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit 
in the inner man. So that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the, to know the love of God, of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. <laughs> Do you hear what he just said? Every time I read this, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. God wants to fill us with his fullness. I mean, how full is that? How full? How big is God? So big is right. And he wants to, and watch this, he wants to fill us with all that. Not the whole church, like, like with the corporately, he wants to fill us all individually so that when we all get together corporately, we explode. <laughs> oh gosh, I love it so much. Ah. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think according to the power, not the power here, the power that's inside of us. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the anointing of God in us, the Holy Ghost in us. He wants, he wants to give us more than you could pray for, more than you could even imagine. And I can imagine a lot. And it's not about stuff. It's about what could we do to be a more effective weapon of righteousness on this earth? How could I raise up a generation that walks together, father and son, daughter and mother, older generation, younger generation. How can I bridge that gap to get the body of Christ to step into her identity in the fullness of God, filling each individual a house with no empty rooms? And when we get together, a town with no empty houses. Fully possessed with the fullness of God, knowing who we're created to be. How can I have that happen? That's one of my goals, and God wants to give me more than I could ask or think, and I could think of that. What could be greater than every Christian on the planet knowing who they're created to be, walking in the miraculous, walking in healing, walking in the prophetic, walking in their identity, walking without jealousy, walking without strife, walking without envy, walking without self-seeking and selfish desires and selfish ambition. How could I affect Christianity in such a way to where every confessing Christian would actually walk out what the Bible says they are. That's a goal. God wants to give me more than that. And I'm thinking, what could be more than that? Only you know. I'm talking about every Christian on the planet. Because if every person on the planet that said they love Jesus would actually live it, the whole world would be saved in a day. The whole world. What if little kids got possessed with the fullness of the knowledge of him? They would totally be convicting to the parents that might not believe it yet. Let a little kid get possessed by God, go into a grocery store and see somebody get out of a wheelchair when your little kid prayed. Let that happen and see what happens to your life. You're either gonna try to shut them down or know that it's God and I'm pretty sure they get out of a wheelchair and they're paralyzed and they get out of a wheelchair and your little kid prayed, you're not gonna have trouble knowing that it was God. Oh my gosh. Listen to this in the, in the Passion Translation. This makes me want to just scream. It says, I kneel humbly in awe. This is Ephesians 3. In awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on the earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. 
Then you will be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences. The great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. The extravagant love. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. I'm going with this. I'm going with this Bible and what it says about me. So I sat back in my prayer room today and I'm just praying and I was praying um, Psalms 23. Oh. My cup overflows. <laughs> he prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies. When it's really scary and everybody hates me, God's like, this is a great place to sit and dine with me. He does it. He prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies. He just wants me to sit down at it. When it's really scary, God loves to announce you're here in the loudspeakers in the devil's camp. My son's here. My daughter just stepped into the room. Ha ha. But he wants us to manifest him in every situation and know the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Are you with me? Gosh, I'm already in the negative. Time is kicking the other way. <laughs> Jesus talks to the woman at the well and says this. He says, give me a drink. She says, sir, the well is deep. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We don't drink from the same cup. How would you get this? Like, she goes, we don't do this. He goes, if you knew who was asking you, you would ask him for a drink. And he would give you a drink of life-giving water. And you would never be thirsty again. So, in one aspect, Jesus is saying that when he's crucified, because he said it again, he goes, all who are thirsty, let them come to me. He who comes to me will never be thirsty. Yet he tells us to hunger and thirst for righteousness, and we shall be filled. When he comes in you, he creates a well that is deeper, it's, it's never ending. But in order for you to have the right constant flow of him and the knowledge of him, you have to do this by the place of right standing with God. Or otherwise you will not believe that you deserve this. Or you believe that you'll have to earn it. You won't believe that it was given freely. See, when Jesus did what he did, it was to present you blameless. When you got born again in the Father's eyes, you became blameless. Because we never step into what really happened there, and we kind of just listen to what other people say about what happened there, that's not gonna do it. I read this morning in 1 Peter 2, when, Jesus, when, when, when Peter is talking, and he says, Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So many people have come to Christ and not taken the proper nutrients to grow. And there are wars and fights among us because of selfishness and because of things that we shouldn't be fighting about. When you get saved, you got a pacifier in your mouth just like an infant. When you're born again as a baby, you are, you are, you're not even teething yet. You get me? You have a pacifier. Most people, because they can't see it or feel it, 
live pacified for their Christian life. 95% of Christians don't share their faith, never lead somebody to Jesus. That ought not be. It's because we're feeding on the wrong stuff. You can be going to church, you can be writing, reading the right books, but if you never open this book and let God fill you with the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, you'll never know who you're truly created to be. The well that's in you is deep. And Jesus said those who come to him will never thirst again. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary, burdened down by life, come to me and I will give you rest. The initial rest that we get when we come to Jesus cannot be sustained unless you join Holy Spirit and learn from him. He says, take upon you, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Learn from me, I am meek and lowly, and you will find rest for your soul. He gave us rest when we got saved, but your soul coming into true rest is learning straight from the master. <laughs> this is how we live in a place of never being thirsty. For what? That lady wasn't getting living water. That lady was getting physical water. She was getting the bare, the basic necessities of life. Jesus was saying that you will never ever grow thirsty for the basic necessities of life if you discover real life. <sighs> if you tap into this, I promise you, your everything will change. You will look in the mirror and never see yesterday. You'll never wake up guilty or ashamed or condemned again. Like in my life, this finished work is so deep and so big for me that when I mess up, when I mess up, and I know it, and the Holy Spirit corrects me, as soon as I see it, repentance happens, and that thing doesn't have a voice in my life. I, I'm not kidding, no matter what it is. So like in this context of me kind of of me kind of diving in and looking into like different departments that are part of lifestyle, trying to see what's going on. It was wrong for me to do that because they're doing their job and it made them question whether I believed they could. Which causes like a weird mistrust thing, but that was never in my heart. But I caused it myself, I did it. So now that I see it, I'm out. But not just out, I'm not guilty. <laughs> This is everything in life. It's not just when you get saved and your sin gets washed away. It's everything. When you mess up and you confess to God, he is faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. What does that mean? Now I'm gonna learn how to bear fruit that's worthy of repentance. So now I repent, so now I'm gonna bear fruit that shows that I did. Oh. Okay. Um, can I just get worship, if there's anybody here? Kenny, you're here. All right, good. I've... Oh yeah, hey, thanks for like skipping the football game and stuff. I, I mean, I, I don't mind it. We showed it here last year, we had it here last year. But like, um, thanks for coming here. People were like, hurry up, man, it's still going. What time does it end? What time does it start? What time did it start? 5.30, oh wow, it's over. Who won? Who's winning? The Bucks are? What's the score? What is it? Five to 30. Oh, wow. Well, look, let's pray for the underdog. I'm the worst person to be at a football game because I root for both teams. They're all children of God and don't know it. I told Theo, because he's a, he's a Tampa Bay guy, because he's from Florida, so he's like, he told me the other day, he goes, bro, you're like, you're for the bucks, right? I go, absolutely not, dude. So I thought he was talking about money. I'm like, what's wrong with you? No, 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 the Tampa Bay, no, no, I'm not. I'm not for them. Last year when Kansas City prayed, there was like prophecy hanging on it. 
I don't know if you remember, but we talked about revival. Bob Jones, when Kansas City hits the Super Bowl and they win. So in my heart, what's wrong with them keeping winning until we have revival, right? I'm sorry. sorry, I don't mean to go down that road. No, I, I really do, I root for both teams. I don't have a team. I'm on Team Jesus and he's for all of them, yeah. I know, you say that's great, but sit in the game with people that really love a team and go, wow, awesome. They're like, oh yeah, you're on my side. And then the other team scores and you're like, yeah, you're like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I know that's whack, right? Okay, sorry, yeah. Sorry, I just messed everything up. Just go home, love you, no. If, here's my, here's my question. This morning I asked everybody, if you feel like you've kind of have taken on a whole bunch of stuff that you know you probably shouldn't have and there are other people around you that have that grace on their life, I wanna ask you. <clears throat> so like with me, I've tried to take on a whole bunch of stuff that I shouldn't have and, and, and what it did was it caused me to think about a whole bunch of different things that I never needed to think about. So because I sincerely wanna see things succeed, that stuff's always like trying to figure it out. But when God showed me, I just went Shh. And I'm like, and that can be me again. Like, I just love it. So if you feel like in your life, you've kind of bit off more than you needed to, and you're involved way more than you have to be in certain situations, and the Lord will tell you in your heart, if you feel like you've had that happen, and you're in the midst of that right now, and I, I described it this morning as like a pressure cooker. You get that little thing on the top that's rolling. Don't take the lid off, buddy, because if you take the lid, but I feel like, I feel like there are people here, I felt it this morning too, that they're like a pressure cooker. And it's just, there's this tension. And because you've kind of stepped out of grace, there's only grace on your life to do what God's called you to do but you're not created to do everything. Are you with me? So if that's you, I just want you to stand up, we wanna pray. And if it's nobody, that's okay, I'm standing, so. It's not a bad thing, and this isn't like you're gonna let go of all your responsibilities, that's not it. There's just grace on people's life to handle certain things. I'm not created to handle everything. That's why God calls us to be the body, there's only one head, and it's Jesus. Are you with me? So if God's called, amen. So if God's called us, you have a little prophet there. If God's called you to something, then he puts grace to get there. But he also puts people around you to help. And sometimes, like I described my life as that song, Jesus Take the Wheel, where like, this is responsibility. And I don't want anything going down. Not that, not that we ever did, but that thought of what if? What if people aren't? What if it's not? What if? I couldn't do that. I just, I took on more than I needed to. So being vulnerable, I said, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm actually getting a coach that's coming just to help me. Um, Danny Silk is actually gonna help me. Sherry Silk's gonna help me. Just different people, because I want to create a culture of honor here. I wanna create that. I wanna be, I wanna be, uh, I wanna be a, a son of encouragement. I wanna be that, that's where my, that's my lane, man. My lane is to be an encouragement to everybody else, but sometimes we take on so much and we think that we're everybody's savior and we're not. Jesus is the savior, amen, amen. Who's here, who's gonna close? Jason?